Hey guys, welcome to another Game Explained discussion. I'm your host, Andre Seegers, and Ash and I are here to discuss a bunch of Nintendo stuff from Nintendo Dawn, who just came back from a recent Nintendo event where we learned new details on Mario Party Star Rush, Paper Mario Color Splash, and got hands-on time with Sonic Boom, Fire and Ice, Dragon Quest VII, and even Zelda Wii U. So, let's get right into it. Alright Don, so you just got back from Nintendo as I said, and you saw a whole bunch of stuff, even beyond what they showed and announced at E3. Um, and I think we should mm -hmm. start off here with Mario Party Star Rush, but that's a game that even though they showed off on Treehouse Live, it feels like a game we still don't know a ton of stuff about. True. Uh, whereas, it, it sounds like you learned a lot more about it at this event. Um, so yeah, give us a details on this game, like what stood out to you about the Star Rush? Interesting enough, in our presentation they actually started right from the main menu. Um, so we kind of had a better sense of how much stuff there's in this game. And it's clear that Toad Scramble is the main mode of this game. Like, this is the game mode you will play alone or with friends. Um, and level-wise, there are four worlds with each three levels. So it seems that there are 12 levels in total of these grid-based boards. And basically, your goal is to get those stars. And Again, you can, just in other Mario Party games, which they didn't put a lot of emphasis on during the Treehouse stream, is you can get them, still get them with coins at the end of the game, um, but you also get them by defeating those bosses that you have to walk up to. So basically, your goal is to defeat the bosses, get as many coins as possible, and rule the grid base board. Okay, I see. So it sounds, uh, so the boss fights are basically similar to Mario Party 9 and 10, right? So basically, um, everybody is a different space on the board, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what they implemented, and this is very clever, uh, the further you are away of the boss, the more you have to tap the A button to get close to the boss again before you can enter the boss battle. So the person who entered the boss space has an advantage to score as much points as possible before the other players join the battle. Okay, now you said you have to press A to join the battle? Yeah, the others have to press A to get closer to the boss space before joining the battle. Okay, I see. So it sounds like it might be a half step toward maybe more traditional Mario Party, even though it's kind of doing its own thing. It's, it sounds like just the fact that you're not driving around in a car together might make this a little more similar to previous entries than 9 and 10. Right, yeah. I mean, it's still like a big mini game, but there is more purpose to being as close to that space as possible. Now, you said there's 12 boards for that mode. Did you see one of the new boards, or any of the new boards, uh, besides the one we saw at E3? It seems to be like really standard Mario Theater. There's a beach board, boards, there are desert boards, there are the green grass boards. Um, so it's pretty basic stuff so, so far I've seen. We were at a beach board, I believe, uh, which had this... Um, my big problem with like the boards in Mario Party Star Rush is that they're all these grid-based mechanics with like spaces scattered everywhere. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I mean, it is really different and weird for a Mario Party game. At the same time, I do appreciate this more than what the stuff what they did in the previous 3DS games and the last two entries on Wii and Wii U. Mm -hmm. So there is that. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've always said I respect Mario Party for trying something new. It's just that, so far, the new stuff they tried hasn't been that fun. But, it looks like this one is a step in the right direction. Um, now, you mentioned there's other modes, too, beyond... Or, are there other modes beyond um, the Toad Rush mode, or whatever it's called? The, uh, Toad Scramble. Toad Scramble, yeah. Yeah, they didn't really show us anything. Like, we had a quick glance at the main menu, and there was something called the Character Museum. Okay. That's something I saw, and there was were other options which they didn't really highlight what it exactly was. They immediately wanted to save them. And we're going quickly to Toad Scramble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Nintendo. The spaces are, again, you're pretty basic fare. I mean, you have item spaces, which you get to, like free items for, you don't have to pay for them, just walk up to and you get an item. Uh, one of the items they showed was a dash mushroom, which gets you free additional squares on top of what you roll. And Depending on how much allies you actually have in your party, you get additional like rolls on top of your own roll, which um, would give you huge adventures like further on into the game. Um, which is again, it's it's quite different and interesting. Um, and there are so-called coin balloons, and these start the mini games now, the random mini games that are not the boss battles. Uh, and one of the mini games we saw 
was that you had to avoid these these bum rats, the little Goombas from New Super Mario Bros. U. Mm-hmm. Um, and you had to carry like um, a tray of nuts towards the end of the goal. And if you would lose them, you're out. Um, and the end of the goal, how much you have left the, decides pretty much the winner. Um, the nice thing is that everybody who participates still gets coins. So regardless if you win or lose, you still get coins. For yeah. so the number one gets five, and the loser get, just gets one. Sounds it, like traditional Mario Party in that sense, at least. Yeah, it seems way more traditional to Mario Party, even though like the the ally mechanics and how the board is laid out are very different. Um, with the, with the ally characters, what I find really interesting is that each has their own specific ability that makes them stand out. If you Get them to join your party. Uh, for example, in Mario's case, you get a super dice block, which adds a seven, but also a zero to your dice block, so it could go either way for you. Oh, okay, interesting. So, depending on which ally you do or which Mario character you team up with during Toad Scramble, you get a different advantage or possible advantage then. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, cool. So, it, it, so some seeds based on choosing your ally characters right, um, getting to t- various specific spaces. Because if you land both on the same space, um, you can actually fight in the battle to get to gain an ally of a different of your arrival. Um, so it, it seems to be very competitive based which is something that i feel mario party lost its touch for like since nine yeah definitely no, I, I completely agree i mean i i think j- just the the core element of, of traversing the board together in in a car i mean even though you are technically still playing against one another it still doesn't feel quite as as competitive as it used to i think just by virtue of the fact that you are still working together as well so that the, it is it is interesting to note how they are kind of changing things up to go back more toward the traditional format for this one, it seems, to a degree, while still doing something different. And I feel that the stuff they do different, like still moving all at the same time, it makes sense to keep the game moving at, at a steady pace, and I feel that the changes they're making with that stuff at least seem fun. With the things they tried 9 and 10, I, get, I applaud them for trying, but it seems that they lost touch of what Mario Party, what makes Mario Party actually competitive and interesting. Like being able to do things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Move on your sure. own. Yeah. Having agency. Yeah. So I, I know you saw a fair amount of that game. Uh, did anything else stand out to you, or like, did you learn any other details that were interesting that we didn't know about before? I mean, they showed us a bunch of those, a bunch of those boss games, um, mm. like the like the Mega Goomba and Big Bomb Bomb, which are. I mean, they're pretty standard, like I would expect them in Mario Party 9 and 10 to be. So if you have more allies on you, you actually get more chances to progress a little bit faster. So it makes ally characters all that more special. Um, But outside of that, it seems um, that they that they tried to show us pretty pretty much what we can expect with the game, which I pretty much highlighted. All right. Well, speaking of uh, de- divisive franchises, there was another game you saw <laughs> that uh, we saw. We learned more about at E3 being Paper Mario Color Splash, and evidently right. they showed you a whole new area of the game or some new levels that they didn't show off at E3. Uh, so, can you tell us more about what you saw and what your impressions of them are? Well, they didn't go too deeply into new stuff. They basically tried to splice it off with stuff that we have already seen before. Um, they showed us like like previous starting areas of those levels that they showed at E3. So they showed us the proper start of each stage, they showed us new dialogue, they stopped to show us more elements of the game, which with, with three hours they really quickly went through all of that stuff uh. and s- skimmed over things because for the sake of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got to see a lot more battles and how... And here's my thing with the battle system in Color Splash. Um, did both of you play Sticker Star? I did, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and I did as well, Actually, and, and I didn't love it, but I didn't really hate it as much as Andre did either. That's why you did your team, uh, Callie. And not oh, the here proper. we go. We're going to bring up the Callie versus Marie thing. 
Splatfest. Hey, we, we, we're two against one here. Two it's of us true. are for Marie. The, Don and I are on the right side <laughs> of history, my friend. It's okay, you know, you, you guys will come to see the light eventually. You know, I mean, obviously, if you're not on Team Cali, you're just wrong, uh-huh. and your your opinion is wrong. So, you know, I have faith hey, in you guys hey, to Ash. see the light. It's hey, okay. Ash, hey, Ash. It's okay to be wrong someday, my friend. <laughs> it had to happen eventually. This is just going to be, become a, yeah. a Cali versus Marie discussion. <laughs> I know. This yeah. completely derailed us. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so sorry, Don. Continue. Nope. <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, so... My problem with that game is that I felt that there was not a lot of strategy in the battles. And I felt... I mean, in that, like, the best strategy was to avoid the battles. <laughs> yeah, but even the timing stuff seems well, seemed well underplayed in that game. Mm-hmm. Um, really? Which is one of the things... Yeah, which one of the things I liked um, in the previous, even in Super Paper Mario, all things considered. Um, what I feel they're going back to with Paper Mario Color Splash is that timing mechanic. But you have to still have to time your attacks really well to perform. Um, and that still requires some strategy, which I actually feel that they are using a lot more of in Color Splash and in the battle mechanics. And especially also with the cards now, because you can follow, fully color them in, color them in and use a lot of your color, but you can also just, you have them have the strength and even just even still perform in those battles and there's, there's a lot of stuff going on especially with the different cards and stuff and how easier it is now to have those thing cards and not being a pain in the ass as much as sticker star was mm-hmm. because basically when you now pick up a thing in the game it squeezes out all the color it replenishes some of your color bars and then becomes simply becomes a card in your inventory there's nothing more to it. So, so you don't have to go to like a shop in town to have them turn it into a card for you. It happens automatically now. Yeah. Okay. That's that sounds that's actually good. it's just streamlining um, the process of Sticker Star a bit, which sounds like a good idea. Now, did mm-hmm. they show you uh, anything beyond what we saw at the or any new levels, for instance, or parts of the levels or more of the levels that we've already seen? I don't know how much I can talk about, and this is my problem. Um, at least I can tell you that from the stuff that I've seen, um, there are more going for variety, um, mm-hmm. which is my big takeaway from the entire thing. Um, which again, that was my problem with Sticker Star. I didn't hate it, but there was it felt generic. That's yeah. I think probably that's the best way to put it. Again, it's totes, but it's a lot of character, and they are very comedic in how they perform and act. Um, mm-hmm. Even with the, the the thing stuff, like for example, with Morton and throwing a, a fire extinguisher at him, it, it it seems to go a lot more for humor with the thing cards and even in the in the dialogue and stuff, which I really really like. Um, so yeah, from the stuff I've seen, it seems more adventure ish, um, which is not really straight on RPG stuff still, mm-hmm. but hey, it's actually enjoyable. So I probably maybe will like the game. Yeah, well, let, let's hope. I mean, it looks like they, it does seem like they are learning some lessons from Sticker Star, which is great uh, because I definitely don't want to play through that game again. It does sound, Don, that you think that it, the so far the Color Splash seems to be a marked improvement over. Uh, I'm sorry, the Color Splash seems to be a marked improvement over Sticker Star. Like it seems like they're at least improving upon both the gameplay in terms of the uh, you know added emphasis on timing and strategy in battle in battles and also the writing the, the quality of the humor is just they're both improved upon from sticker stars what it's kind of what i'm gathering definitely and i also think that the whole color mechanic at least seems intriguing like those blank spots might not do it as much but um especially with what you can interact with in the world um it seems to be going for for style and substance which I really think is it's going to be the deal breaker here if it can keep it up, especially with the stuff I've seen and then maybe with the stuff later. Um, then maybe this could be like the surprise that nobody was really expecting it to be. I'm at least more hopeful than I was when they first announced it, which is already a long way. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no kidding. So that pretty much covers it for the games you weren't able to play, but you were actually able to go hands-on with several other games, including uh, Sonic Boom, Fire, and Ice. Um, so what all did you get to see of this one, Don? Like, anything 
extra like you got to start from the beginning of the game right like you they had the full game there basically yeah they basically allowed us to start a new game and play from the beginning so i actually got to see the opening and it was actually um where i felt that the openings of the two sonic boom games on when they pre before they announced the tv show they they were very sterile i feel mm -hmm. this was more on point with the humor of the tv show which is really good because the tv show is actually very decent so <laughs> That's actually very good. Um, but then I got to play through the majority of the first world. And I think the first thing I will straight away say is this is already a way better game than what they tried with the first 3DS game. But even though I liked some parts of that, I, I back then I gave it a 5 out of 10, which is not terrible, just kind of there. But at the same time, there was a lot of unneeded exploration where you got kind of confused in levels, you didn't really know where to go, um, the game was also really short and you had to do a lot of backtracking. Um, this game seemed more to have a pace to it. You would kind of fly through those levels and the first level I would say was about two minutes long. Uh, you do a lot of, lot of sprinting, you would switch between the fire and ice mechanics, so with um, ice you would go over bodies of water and they would freeze and you could rock upon them with, with fire you could raise ice blocks you could quickly move through the environments and they would string that together with the the, the traditional bee homing attack and your sprint of sonic and i honestly felt this felt a lot better more straightforward because they really over complicated that first 3DS game to a point that I didn't really enjoy at the end very much anymore. Um, and what they are, are doing is making the level straightforward and fun. Um, so I feel that Senzuro who made the first 3DS game and I'm making now Fire and Ice learned from those, those mistakes and actually see what the feedback was of that first game. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that Sanzaru Games actually paid lip service to that specifically, saying, you know, Fire and Ice will be the product of, of everything we've listened to in terms of the criticisms from Shattered Crystal. And for what it's worth, I'd say I played maybe 10 minutes. Um, I, I think it was a beach level, so I'm, I'm guessing it was the beginning, beginning of the game. Um, and I agree with you. I, it, it felt a lot more streamlined, and it felt a lot more like there was a focus. I think Shattered Crystal... It wasn't a mechanically bad game, but it just felt like it lacked focus, and I completely agree that the levels were way too focused on exploration, which made the, le <laughs> the levels themselves feel kind of meandering and just kind of not as snappy as I would like for a 2D Sonic game. And uh, I, I already got the sense, like what you said, Don, from the five, ten minutes I played, that the level design was just more streamlined and more focused on action and getting where you, getting you where you want to go and having a good time, and not necessarily <laughs> just wandering and exploring aimlessly yeah i the first time i immediately started playing i would have expecting to be it the level speed to be like five six minutes long again like in right. Shadow crystal um but i flew for those levels like the levels were like two three minutes which is the perfect point for like a handheld game like playing a level put it down go on again the next time and i feel that they Next to the exploration, they over, don't overcomplicate the mechanics. They they very chill in a very nice way. They introduce like you can do this, you can do that, and at the end of like level two or three, you know everything you can do with the different characters that you have in your in your in your slots at that point, um, which again feels nice and I feel that the powers that each character possesses like the first two levels I played as Sonic and then later as Amy I feel that um, Sonic has his dash move and a Amy has, his ham has her hammer um, they actually make some good differentiation of what those characters can do um, which again goes a long way because I felt that um, in Shadow Crystal it felt a little bit too gimmicky all right. Now another game you got to play was uh, Dragon Quest VII. Um, so what all did you see at this one, and what did you think? So um, before we got to play, they actually throw us into a little presentation from, hey, this is the save file you're going to play, so you know what is up. Um, and in the demo that we got to play, which took town, place in town called Bellamoy, Bella um, we had 
to basically save all the women in a village. Mm -hmm. Because uh, some evil monster saw all of the women in the village. Mm -hmm. And all of the men were totally depressed. So we had to go to a tower and save them. So the, the immediate thing that stood out to me, and this is a very classic old PlayStation game, is that the hub worlds and the worlds that you explore are kind of small. I mean... It is a remake of a game that is has been back on the PlayStation, so I kind of understand. But it's kind of shocking to don't have the no much as the freedom that you would expect from the more modern Dragon Quest games. So I had to kind of get used to that, and I walked through the levels, and it looked really good in 3D. Which um, what I heard from the Japanese version is that a lot of people had problems with the frame rate and stuff. I didn't see any problems with the frame rate, even if I turn on the 3D which was really good. So either I'm not at the point of the game where it's really terrible, or they improved it, which is either way possible. Yeah, were you, were you playing on a new 3DS? I was playing on a new 3DS XL, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if maybe they optimized it for, for that system, perhaps. They might, I'm not sure. Uh, even though you can still not use the C-Stick, so you still need to use L and R to change the camera angle. So... I'm not sure what is up with that. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe not then. <laughs> uh, did you play the original PS2 version of Dragon Quest VII? Here's the thing, it never came out in Europe. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you didn't then. Uh, and and the, the guy of who introduced us from NOE actually said, you can now play it for the first time legally in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. <laughs> well, I, I know, for, for, I'm, I'm not a big Dragon Quest fan, but, but from what I understand, this 3DS version of 7 is kind of ratcheting up the focus on the storytelling, and I, I think kind of making it feel a little bit more like 8, uh, in, in terms of mm. the kind of traditional story-based structure. Now, this I could be completely wrong about this, but I know 7 originally was kind of more of an old-school Dragon Quest game, and that it was, you know, certainly focused on gameplay before story, and... From what I understand, right. they're trying to balance the two out a little bit more for this release. It, it seemed there was a lot of um, more interaction and talking than I expected it to be. Um, but it also didn't help that we are completely thrown into a demo that was somewhere middle of the game. So, I don't know that for sure. Um, uh, but I um, I did enjoy the dialogue and what I'd done with it. And for what it's worth, the battle system is still pretty much Dragon Quest. Um, we were actually the three party members and the fourth one, there was a local hero, so the local hero would do its own stuff whenever he liked to. Um, and this local hero that joined into battle was way overpowered, uh, who did like attacks of what, like 175 damage, like multiple times critical hits, which um, <laughs> seemed kind of crazy and we I had barely had to do anything in battle sometimes uh, so it seemed kind of easy but the the point was going to the tower get, getting to a stone golem and destroying it and then going further into the dungeon to save those women so it was pretty basic stuff but I kind of enjoyed it and for what, uh, again for what it's worth you can still like add tactics to the various characters and let them auto battle you can still choose your attacks carefully you can do whatever you like within that battle system and the touch screen shows a map which is always handy that is one of the uh, you know ever present best uses of the, of the bottom screen as far as I'm concerned for, for RPGs and things like that yeah I do, I do like because they told us a lot about the story I did like what they're going for because basically you find, in the beginning of the game you fight four tablets and then you get transported in the past and it seems that there are other worlds within that world there and when you complete tasks in the past uh, those parts of the world um, go back into existence and go from having a bleak future to bleak future to a bright future um, which gives you also new stuff to explore when you go back to the present day oh, okay so that sounds like it almost has a bit of like a chrono trigger-esque element too where things you do in the past can affect the directly affect the the appearance and the you know what you can do and explore in the world in the present yeah it seems that they're going for that which is which seems fun to me i would definitely play for the game once i get my hands on it well, just be careful, or just be wary, because I, I have heard that the original Dragon Quest VII is like 
200 hours long or something crazy like that so jeez okay steal yourself no well it may maybe more like 80 or 90 hours but i've heard it that if you want to do everything it can be well over 100 so like hmm. just st- prepare yourself set, set aside a large block of time i will do it at <laughs> sure. nice well, speaking of needing a lot of time to play through a game, uh, one other game you got played through, which seems to be massive in scope, is uh, Zelda. Now, I think you got to see the same stuff we saw at E3, basically. But you were telling me mm-hmm. before that they also showed off um, like some more advanced tactics that they hadn't covered on the Treehouse Live. And one of the ones you told me in particular sounded freaking awesome. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about like what you saw and learned about Zelda? I would like to know which tactic I talked about that you are so interested in. <laughs> oh, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the seesaw thing, or not seesaw, but the, um... Okay, I, I, actually, I didn't hear, I didn't tell Ashley, so this will be really fun. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if you saw the Magneto stuff where they, um, go into the lake and pull out the boulder and, like, the, um, the plank and everything from the water and the treasure chests. Um, so one thing that they did with all of that stuff is they pulled out a chest, they put the plank on top of it, Link was put at one side, and then they picked up the boulder, throw the boulder at the other side, and they let Link up throw very high into the air. Nice. Like, I just love the idea that you can use a physics engine to create these uh, contra- contraptions, in this case a catapult, like just using stuff down in the environment. That is so cool. Yeah. Yeah, another yeah. thing they showed off, and this is something they actually tried to do also in the Treehouse demos, was that they would go to the skull place where all the Bobblins are, um, and they would shoot down the lantern, and they would explode all of those barrels, and only the Blue Bobblin would be left, and you would have to defeat them, and then you can also easily pick up all of those items in the, in the cave, which yeah. is the most epic thing you will see in that entire <laughs> thing. <laughs> Um, that, I think they tried to do that on the treehouse and they failed at it, at least in the segment I saw. So it's pretty awesome that you were able to fulfill um, what Nintendo didn't. Yeah, I actually reco- I recorded that too, so hopefully someday you'll see it. Someday? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> someday Years soon. from now. <laughs> well, someday soon, for yeah. sure. Well, I think that about wraps up for us here. So thanks guys for watching. Uh, Don, do you want to tell people where they can find you at? Oh, wow. I never expected that. Uh, <laughs> no, it never happens. Well, never ask you that. <laughs> so, you, should I say the same sentence again? Whatever. You can find me at way too many places. So if you just the Google Nintendo line. Don, it'll pop up everywhere. Go Nintendo, Nintendo I mean, World Report, his YouTube yeah. channel. You can find me You can find me on the Twitters. You can find me on Nintendo World Report. You can find me at Go Nintendo. You can find me wherever you want. Just <laughs> Anywhere believe. Anywhere you want. <laughs> Just and believe. Of, and of course, make sure to keep an eye on Game Explained for more on everything we talked about at some point and other things gaming as well. Catch you guys later. Bye. <laughs>